All right, it is seven o'clock. Uh, I know there's still people coming in the room, but, but let's get started. I am German, I put in the chat, I'm, I'm a German citizen, um, which I just told Joe is, is kind of ironic. They asked the non-German to moderate the webinar, uh, the, sorry, the non-American moderate a webinar with the American, introducing the non-American talking about America. I think I got that right, um, but I love to talk well, and I'm excited to, uh, to be part of this. Um, and so uh, my name is Soren Schwab. I'm the VP of Partnerships here at, at CLT. i um, been here since 2018, uh, and I'm so excited for this third installment of the journey through the author bank. Um, it's our, yeah, just our third time. We had Dante a couple of weeks ago. We had Tolkien, and now we have uh, Alexis de Tocqueville. Um, so we have some French representation. Been at CLT since 2018, and really have seen CLT grow from this crazy idea that our founder, Jeremy Tate, had. Uh, a few years prior to, to where we are now. Um, if you're not too familiar with CLT, just like kind of give a little bit of a, of a pitch here, right? Um, we are an assessment company. We provide standardized tests for grades seven through 12. And you might say, well, that's boring. And you know, a few years ago, I probably would have agreed with you, um, but CLT really does it differently. We do it in a beautiful and in a powerful way. Uh, when I was a high school English teacher, I was pretty disillusioned with some of the standardized tests out there, whether it's Iowa or AC or a PSAT, and really so were my students. Most of them were bored out of their minds because they had to read passages about naked mole rats and, and the history of mustard. No kidding, that actually was a passage on the SAT. Quite fascinating, it's not. Uh, or, you know, the latest young adult fiction. Um, and we're really trying to change education for the better. And we think that putting students in front of authors that have shaped our culture, our thoughts, our uh, history, from Aristotle to Aquinas, from Dante to Dickens, from Bonhoeffer to Baldwin, I love alliterations. Um, you know, we want to expose you, whether it's parents, teachers, administrators, students, um, to the best of what's been thought and said. And so that's where this webinar series come to play. We have an author bank, and I'm actually going to share my share my screen here um, so you can take, take a look at that. Give me one second here. Nope, that's the wrong screen. One second. Former teacher, totally not prepared. No, I am. There we go. All right. Uh, Joe, nod if you can see the author bank. <laughs> Perfect. That's great. So, like, it's on the website here, um, on the CLT, cltexam.com um, website. Uh, and so it's under tests, and then you can click on author bank. Um, and it's an incredible, credible list of authors. If you look through here, um, it's just it's just mind boggling. And, I, and I've read, I'm, I'm pretty well read, but there are so many authors that I still have not read. Um, there are some of them are hyperlinked which means that we also have a, a journal, a CLT journal, a blog. Uh, and so many of them we have written about or we've had guest, guest writers. I think, Joe, you wrote, about whom did you write or did you write about just the Const Constitution? Constitution, yeah. Constitution, so, um, so also great to, to check out. Um, and what's, what's so important about this, this author bank is that uh, every assessment, whether it's for the seventh graders, the ninth graders, the 11th graders, uh, two thirds of the authors on those passages come from this author bank. And so it's really shaping, you know, what we want to put in front of in front of students. And so we had this idea: well, if we have this rich author bank, one, and we have amazing friends uh, in, in in college and universities that are experts on these authors, why not ask them to to present on on those authors? You know, they're passionate about them. And so uh, Dr. Wazaki is here to present on on De Tocqueville, and we couldn't be more more excited. Um, and honestly, you know, being part of CLT is amazing for various reasons, but, but the connections that, that we are able to form with so many like-minded individuals and, and scholars uh, is probably my favorite part. And, and, and Joe really has become a good friend these last few years. I think Atlanta, three, three and a half years ago, Joe, I think that's when I met you first. And you drove, yep. you drove all the way down from, from Charlotte. For like a two-hour uh, event. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, you drove back home. Yeah. You drove back home that night. Um, so, and, and I think I've, there, I think there have been months when I when I when I when I saw you more than my, my wife at all these conferences. And, um, but it's been it's been such a joy getting to know you. So Dr. Waisaki is the dean of the Honors College at Belmont Abbey College. Um, he served previously as the assistant academic dean, um, and he's been there since 2010. Uh, you know, he he's he is full of wisdom and knowledge, especially about the great books, and teaches a lot of the the great books classes in the Honors College curriculum. But the particular focus of Dr. Wazaki is in classical political philosophy and American political thought, which comes in quite handy when we talk about de Tocqueville. Um, Dr. Wazaki received his BA um, from, Be uh, from uh, Belmont Abbey College. 
um, and then his master's and his PhD from Baylor University in political science. Um, he serves on the Council of Scholars for the American Academy for Liberal Education and also on the Board of Academic Advisors for CLT. Um, I mentioned it earlier, just bought, bought a new house, but it's still in Gastonia, right? North Carolina? Yeah. <laughs> with, with, uh, with your wife. And I got to keep track. Is it is it 16 kids at this point? <laughs> Just six, just six. <laughs> All right, with his wife, Jean, and his six children. Dr. Waisaki, so excited to have you here. Um, uh, entertain us. Tell us about okay. Detroit Will. Um, sure. and, and just for everyone's uh, knowledge, we do have a chat function at the bottom. I'll leave that open. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. There will be a Q&A after Dr. Waisaki is done with his formal um, presentation. So if you have questions about De Tocqueville, if you have questions about democracy in America, uh, or if you have questions about, about the Abbey, uh, Belmont Abbey College, um, just outside of Charlotte, beautiful campus. If you haven't been, you should definitely visit um, it is it is a great, great college. And if you have any questions about that, about honors colleges, about scholarships, uh, majors, whatever it might be, um, we're going to be able to do some Q&A after. So with that, Dr. Wazaki, thanks for being here. And, and I look forward to, to hearing your presentation. Thank you so much, Soren. Uh, it's, it's always wonderful to be with you guys at CLT um, when I get to see in person and when I get to do these webinars. Um, and you guys are just doing a tremendous job of like you said, bringing, bringing people together. You guys are really at sort of the hub uh, for all of this, and uh, it's really commendable. Uh, thank you all for showing up tonight. I'm, I'm delighted to talk with you about Tocqueville. Uh, Alexa de Tocqueville is a, an author that at Belmont Abbey College in the Honors College, all of our students take one entire course during their senior year dedicated to the thought of Alexa de Tocqueville. In a, a part of our great books curriculum, we call the crises in the West. And we, we use Alexa de Tocqueville to really understand that crisis or that crisis rather and, and how we might navigate it. He's uh, my favorite author to talk about, my favorite author to teach. Um, and so what we're gonna do tonight, I'm just gonna give you a brief introduction to him, his life and his works. And then we're gonna, we're gonna do a guided read through some of the most important passages in democracy in America. It's really difficult to do that. The book is 600 pages. Um, and there is just so much wisdom packed into every single page uh, that getting rid of sections is sort of like uh, getting rid of one's own children. They're just all so wonderful and important. Um, so we're just going to, I'm going to give you a little bit of a sample of how you might approach this text if you were to see it uh, on the CLT. And hopefully, even if you don't, uh, it'll get you to go and read Tocqueville. That's, that's what I would love for you to do. And, and maybe come here and do it with us. Uh, I'm just going to share my PowerPoint here. It is uh, not a fancy PowerPoint because I, I'm not a PowerPoint guy. I'm a, I'm a book guy, but um, let me bring it up here. All right. All right. Where is it? It is view. All right. So Journey Through the Author Bank, Alexa de Tocqueville. Let's begin with just a brief introduction about the man and his works. Alexa de Tocqueville was born in France in 1805 and died in 1859, which for those of you who know your history, means that he lived after the French Revolution. Uh, there are other revolts and revolutions during his lifetime, but the big one happens before he's born. Uh, his family has a lot of interesting history tied to the revolution. His grandparents, uh, some of his grandparents were killed during the revolution. He came from an aristocratic family. His own parents were almost killed during the revolution, but were saved. And while Tocqueville lives after the revolution and comes from an aristocratic family, we're gonna talk a little bit more about aristocrat aristocracy versus democracy in a little bit. Um, he's not completely critical of the French revolution. Um, he sees that there were certainly some problems with it. Um, at the same time, he sees some of the, the, the results of that revolution as inevitable and probably good. Um, so he's an interesting character. He wrote three main works, uh, and I put an asterisk there after three because uh, most people think of him as having two great works. But the reason I say there are three is that Democracy in America that we're going to look at tonight was actually written really as two separate works. Uh, I'll talk about his visit to America in a minute, but he wrote the first volume about four years later in 1835. And that first volume of Democracy in America, which he wrote in French, primarily to a French audience, was looking at America and really looking at the political side of America, what democracy meant 
in terms of the political life of Americans. He looked at our constitution, at the life of politics in the states, even at the level of the township. He looked at what Republican government looked like at its best in America and what some of the threats were. This is all in volume one. Five years later, upon further reflection, he writes volume two. And volume two is an amazing treatment really of the social life and what he calls the mores, that is the intellectual, the moral habits of Americans. And this, in this volume two, which is my favorite uh, to, to treat, he is really interested primarily in the soul. He's interested in the effect that democracy has on our souls. The third major work he has is called The Old Regime and the Revolution, which he wrote, as you can see, only three years before his death. This is a much shorter work where he's looking at what France looked like before the revolution and after the revolution. So those are his three main works. We're gonna tonight look at some passages from volume one and volume two in Democracy in America. I wanted to mention one uh, kind of interesting thing before we jump in there. And I, if you see here, I, I have written his three friends. Uh, Soren showed you that large uh, author bank and you see all, in, in that bank, all of these great authors and often what makes these authors great or at least one of the, the necessary components uh, in their work is that they're engaging the other authors in the tradition. What we call in, in the world of great books, they engage in the great conversation. And Alexis de Tocqueville once wrote to his friend in a letter, he said, every day he spends time with his three good friends. And by that he meant uh, three great authors, uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who is in the author bank, a French philosopher, Blaise Pascal, who's also in the author bank, and Montesquieu, uh, who is not in the author bank, but another great French author. And so every single day he had these works and he would just spend a little time reading them. And so Alexis de Tocqueville, part of his greatness is the fact that he is so engaged with this tradition of the great works. So uh, before we jump in, I, I guess I just want to answer the question briefly, why read him? And I think you can only figure that out by having read Democracy in America, you'll have a fuller answer, but I want to offer at least just a tentative answer to that now. I think there are two really important reasons that everybody should read Alexei de Tocqueville. Uh, one is kind of specific for Americans, uh, but well, maybe not. It really is for all people who live in democracy. And that is that if you are interested in preserving a democracy that is dignified, that is good, that is free, if that is a possibility at this time in our history, the key to doing that is at least partly held in democracy in America. So if you want to understand your regime, the threats to the regime, and how you might find some ways out, you should read this. But for those of us who are not all that interested in politics, and there are some of us out there uh, who aren't thinking about um, saving the regime, I think this work is still extremely valuable. And it's because of what I mentioned in volume two of this work, which is that Alexei de Tocqueville has a deep, deep care about our souls. And so for those of us who care about our souls and who understand, who want to understand it, right, who want to understand ourselves, what, what Socrates uh, in the Phaedra says, uh, self-knowledge, what he desires more than anything else, self-knowledge. For those of us who seek self-knowledge, we need to read this book because it tells us, it's like holding up a mirror to ourselves, I should say. Right? It shows us who we are and how our souls have been deeply affected by democracy, both for good, but, but often for ill. So I think that's just a tentative answer to why this author is so, so important. Um, let's talk a little bit about the background of this book, Democracy in America. Uh, in 1831, Alexis de Tocqueville uh, and his good friend came to the United States, and they spent nine months in the United States, and they met with uh, everyone. You can see here, this is a map of his journey. He spent more time in the Northeast, but he spent time in the South as well. Um, he went through most of the states, um, and... He meets with people from all different walks of life. He meets with members of the clergy. He meets with farmers. He meets with merchants. He meets with some of the most important political uh, figures in this time. Uh, for example, he meets with Henry Clay, 
well-known famous speaker of the House of Representatives. Um, and he was only supposed to come to the United States. He had gotten a grant from the French government to examine our prison systems. He was going to look at how we had done prison reform, uh, which at the time was considered to be a very well done American prison reform and bring that back to France and help them to reform their prison systems. Uh, but as you can see, or as you will see, as we go through some of the texts in Democracy in America, he really is interested in everything. He wants to understand this thing, democracy, um, and where it is, where it's going, um, what the pitfalls might be, and how we might avoid them. So uh, that's just a little bit of a background about that journey. So much more can be said, but I'd like to turn to some passages uh, so we can begin to understand how we should read him. So um, before, um, I don't know if my picture's in the way here of what you're saying. Um, before we get to some of the particular passages, um, I want to frame the work as a whole. Right? How do we understand the whole of this 600 page work that covers everything from American religion to American literature to the Constitution to associations uh, to our understanding of honor? How, how do we frame this work that seems to cover everything? Um, well, I want to do that by pointing to the bookends uh, of the entire work. Uh, that is the beginning of volume one and the very end of volume two. And I'm gonna read a lot of passages here and, and, and offer some commentary on them. So I hope you can bear with me. Um, this is, he begins in volume one in, a, in about a 15 page introduction. He lays out what, how he understands this movement toward democracy, away from aristocracy to democracy. And he says the following, for 700 years, there's not a single event among Christians that has not turned to the profit of democracy. Not a man who has not served its triumph, the clergy by spreading enlightenment and by applying within its bosom the principle of Christian equality. Kings by opposing the people to the nobles, nobles by opposing people to the kings. Writers and the learned by creating intellectual riches for democracy's use. Trademen by providing unknown resources for democracy's activity the navigator by finding democracy new worlds. Everywhere you saw the various incidents in the lives of people turn to the profit of democracy. All men aided it by their efforts. Those who had in view contributing to its success and those who did not think of serving it. Those who fought for it and even those who declared themselves its enemies. All were pushed pell-mell along the same path and all worked in common, some despite themselves, others with their knowledge. Blind instruments in the hand of God. So the gradual development of equality of conditions is a providential fact. It has the principal characteristics of one, that is of a providential fact. It's universal, it's lasting, it escapes every day from human power. All events, like all men, serve its development. So this is quite a strong statement, one that we may or may not agree with, but for him, everything seems to be serving a universal movement toward democracy. Um, that is towards equality. We'll talk more about that in just a minute. Right? The clergy serves it. The nobles served it. Merchants, tradesmen, all of these people have been part of this historical march toward democracy. Now, the interesting thing is that Tocqueville also says in the introduction that he stood before this revolution, this wave of democracy, and he saw it with a sort of religious terror. Right? He sees this sort of inevitable movement, but it scares him. Right? It's odd. He says it's providential, and yet there's something scary about it. So what is it? So here, here we begin. We see he thinks there's something about democracy that is beyond our control. It's coming and it's here to stay. But that doesn't mean that human freedom and choice aren't extremely important. And here's the end of the book, volume two, part four, chapter eight, the other part of framing the work, the end. Where is democracy going? What is its end? And where does our choice play a role or how does our choice play a role in democracy? 
in, in some of the most moving lines in the book. And, and one of the reasons I love Tocqueville so much is not only that it's filled with wisdom, he's filled with wisdom, but he writes so beautifully in, in such moving ways. He says, I am not aware that several of my contemporaries have thought that here below, that is on earth, peoples are never masters of themselves and that they obey necessarily, I do not know what, insurmountable and unintelligible force that arises from previous events, from race, from soil or for climate. Those are false and cowardly doctrines, right? So that nothing is in our control that can produce only weak men and pusillanimous nations. Providence has created humanity neither entirely independent. We can't do anything. We have limits historically, physically, nor completely slave. It traces around each man, it is true, a fatal circle out of which he cannot go. But within its vast limits, man is powerful and free, so are peoples. The nations of today cannot make conditions among them not to be equal, but it depends on them whether equality leads them to servitude or liberty, to enlightenment or barbarism, to prosperity or misery. So if we take these two passages we looked at and we put them together, right, we see that Tocqueville sees this movement toward democracy and equality as inevitable, but what that democracy looks like, a democracy because it's tied to equality of servitude or, or liberty, enlightenment or barbarism, prosperity or misery, is very much left up to us. And his entire work is exploring the ways in which we might avoid servitude, barbarism and misery and pursue liberty, enlightenment and prosperity. So we're gonna take a look at a number of examples of how he thinks we might uh, seek those good ends and avoid those pitfalls. Okay, so that's framing the work. A couple of key words and concepts uh, for those of you who see this on the CLT. Um, just a couple of things I wanna go over. Um, the first is democracy versus aristocracy. I've said a little bit about this, but throughout this entire work, that seems to be the comparison for him. Democracy and aristocracy. Those are the two main ways of understanding the world and of understanding politics. For those of you who've read your Aristotle or your Aquinas, you might say, hey, or, or Plato, there are lots of other types of regimes. In Aristotle, for example, we have kingship, aristocracy, polity, and then the bad types of regimes, tyranny, oligarchy, democracy. Well, for Tocqueville, it's these two, democracy or aristocracy, because there's a fundamental difference between those two. That is a view of the world that loves equality and seeks equality, and one that is based on permanent inequality. And so he's constantly comparing these. Um, which one is better? I think we'll see that the answer is um, democracy is both better and worse than aristocracy in different ways. He talks about the social state often. What does he mean by the social state? He simply means the social interactions of people uh, as opposed to government. So the social state could be everything from commercial relations to uh, the relationships between men and women, between um, friends, uh, so those different types of relationships that are not about governed uh, and governors, the social state, which he says is equal, not completely, not, not in the sense that everybody has the same amount of money, but there are not, there's not a sense of permanent inequality like you have in the social state and aristocracy, right? Lords, commons, that doesn't exist. Equality of conditions, we've talked a little bit about. One important word is mores. Uh, my students, when they first come to that, they look at it, they go, mores, it's, it's mores. And for him, he uses this word quite often. Mores means, he calls it in one place, the habits of the heart. But it goes beyond that to the habits of our intellect, the habits of the heart, uh, our sentiments, uh, the way we carry on our intellectual life. And so for him, he's often comparing the mores, these intellectual and moral habits of democracies and aristocracies. Finally, the idea of sovereignty of the people, which means right, that the people rule. Uh, and he says that in America, this is the case more so than anywhere else. Okay, so with those couple of keywords and concepts in mind, let's turn to some of uh, his examination here uh, of these various aspects of democracy. 
Uh, I don't do fancy PowerPoints, but uh, I decided I would uh, do one here based on a, a movie. We're going to look at the bad and the good. So I, I took a picture from the good, the bad, and the ugly. Some of you may know Lee Van Cleef, the bad, the bad. I'm going to give us, we're going to talk about three particular examples of what Tocqueville sees as some of the problems or threats to democracy. Uh, threats that he sees as possibly winning out in America. Uh, so we're going to talk about those and we're going to talk about the good. So we'll end with the good. He has three that we're going to talk about. There are many, many that he looks at. Uh, he has a, an 80 page chapter on slavery in America, which uh, is just too big to talk about in this, um, in this presentation. I want to focus on three. One is something he calls the omnipotence. Uh, and for those of you who know your theology, omnipotence, something we normally ascribe to God, all powerful, the all powerful, uh, and the tyranny of the majority. The tyranny of the majority, something that democracies are prone to. The second is what he, what he calls individualism and materialism. We're going to look at how democratic peoples are more prone to individualism, which isn't what we always mean by that. He has a specific meaning and what our materialism looks like. You'd think aristocrats are more materialist than us, right? They have lots of riches. Uh, you've seen Versailles Palace in France, but he says, well, actually, uh, Democrats are a little prone to being materialistic. And finally, the loss of greatness or the favoring of the low over the high. And we're gonna see a few examples of that. So let's turn to the first here, the bad, omnipotence of the majority. First, let's talk about why he thinks the majority should rule. Why do Democrats, why do we think the majority should rule? And in the first two paragraphs here, he gives us an explanation. He says, the moral dominion of the majority is based in part on the idea that there is more enlightenment and wisdom in many men combined than in one man alone. More in the number than in the choice of legislatures, legislators. It is the theory of equality applied to minds. Right? So think about this. Right. Um, why does the majority get to rule? We're all kind of equal. And that means we're about equally smart. Not exactly, but we're kind of equally smart. Uh, you may be a little better at math, you may be a little bit better at engineering or, or, or literature, but nobody's so smart that they should get more than one vote, right? Um, and so the bigger number of people coming together who decide on one thing outweigh the number of the others, right? Their wisdom out, outweighs the minority. So that's the first kind of idea there, why we would accept majority rule. The second, the moral dominion of the majority is based as well on the principle that the interests of the greatest number must be preferred to those of the few. Uh, the Star Trek friends out there might remember in the search for Spock, no, it's the, so the other one, Ratha Khan, when he dies at the end, right? And he says to Captain Kirk, right, the goods of, of the, the greatest the, of the many must outweigh the goods of the few. And that's right, the sort of utilitarian strain in democracy. Tocqueville sees this, he's worried about it though. He's worried about how much power we give to the, to the majority based on these things. So he says uh, in this last paragraph here, omnipotence in itself seems to me something bad and dangerous. Its exercise seems to me beyond the power of man, whoever he may be. And I see only God who can without danger be all powerful because his wisdom and his justice are always equal to his power. And so he sees this real possibility for danger. We, we, we almost say that the majority is all powerful, but gosh, if we can't be assured of the fact that we are wise and just, um, this is gonna be very dangerous. Um, now, I, wanna, I just wanna point to this. It's a little bit of a lengthier passage. What is one of the, because it's so relevant today for all of us, what, are, what is one of the particularly bad effects of the omnipotence or tyranny of the majority? He has an incredibly insightful passage here about the power that the majority has over thought. It's less so that the majority comes and, and tortures us and kills us, and more so that it stops us from thinking. So let's look at that first paragraph. In America, the majority draws a formidable circle around thought. Within these limits, the writer is free, but woe to him if he dares to go beyond them. 
it isn't that he has to fear an auto de fe. That's uh, what the Spanish Inquisition, right, would use, uh, the torture. But he is exposed to all types of distasteful things and to everyday persecutions. A political career is closed to him. He has offended the only power that has the ability to open it to him, that is, offended the majority. Everything is denied to him, even glory. Before publishing his opinions, he believed he had some partisans. It seems to him that he has them no longer. Now that he has revealed himself to all, for those who censure him speak openly, and those who think as he does, without having his courage keep quiet and distance themselves, he gives in, finally, under the daily effort. He yields and returns to silence, as though he felt remorse for having told the truth. Now, for those of you who have been paying attention to what's going on these days, we talk about this thing called cancel culture, right? This is not new, right? Tocqueville sees this in 1835, right? What he's describing here, this formidable circle around thought, right? Where they're not gonna come and arrest you, but boy, don't try to run for office. Don't try to be a CEO of a company, right? Um, there are certain things you are simply not allowed to say. And Tocqueville sees that, right? The next paragraph I won't read, it's, it's quite long, but you really, you can go back and look at it. Um, he, he shows sort of the old methods of tyranny and then this democratic method. The old was to torture. Think of uh, Braveheart, if you've ever seen Braveheart, you know, at the end where Braveheart's being tortured uh, or, or, you know, Mel Gibson's being tortured. Right? That's what old tyrants would do. They'd go after a few people and they'd use violence. He says this new democratic tyranny it goes straight to the soul. It, it scares you into even speaking, right? Um, and it makes you not even want to speak. They don't need to use violence. And there's something even scarier about that in a way. Um, I encourage you to go back and look at that passage. Okay, so right, this first really troubling, troubling aspect of American democracy. We, because of our, our commitment to the equality of minds, and equal interest, pursuing the, the interest of the greatest, we're willing to give maybe way too much power to our to the majority. And the majority, right, he has a line, I didn't have to put it in there, he says, I know of no country where there's less independence of thought than in the United States, right? Uh, there's less independence of thought than in the United States. And he says, and that's not done by violence. It's done by what this majority does, something to reflect on. Okay, individualism and materialism. This comes from volume two. Right? And at first glance, we might look at that and say, individualism, isn't that, isn't that this great thing, right? The rugged individual. We, uh, the, you know, the American film genre is the Western. We watch uh, High Noon, which I do love. Um, you know, Gary Cooper standing alone, defending the town. Isn't this the rugged individualism, the American West? Well, I think he means something a little bit different here uh, by individualism. And we'll see how it's tied to materialism and how that becomes a problem. Let's take a look at how he defines individualism. Individualism is a recent expression given birth by a new idea. That's the idea of equality. Our fathers, meaning our aristocratic ancestors, knew only egoism. Some translate that as selfishness. Egoism is a passionate and exaggerated love for oneself which leads man to view everything only in terms of himself alone and to prefer himself to everything. Think of that uh, egoism as sort of aggressive, taking more than your own share. Um, you know, um, yeah, so, so, so yeah, taking more than what you deserve. Um, individualism is a considered and peaceful sentiment. It's not necessarily aggressive, not necessarily grasping, that disposes each citizen to isolate himself from the mass of his fellows and to withdraw to one side with his family and friends so that after thus creating a small society for his own use, he willingly abandons the large society to itself. That's right. Think of what we do. We self-select. We're isolated. We have our nuclear family. He points to this elsewhere. We don't, we don't think of extended families like aristocracies do. We, we withdraw with our nuclear family. We take care of them, we take care of ourselves, maybe in a very loving way, we love our spouse, we love our children, but we're not active and engaged citizens, right? We, we withdraw. Egoism is born, right, that first one, out of blind instinct, individualism proceeds from an erroneous judgment. 
rather than from a depraved sentiment. It has its source in failings of the mind as much in the vices of the heart. Egoism parches the seeds of all virtues, so selfishness, all virtues are undermined. Individualism at first dries up only the source of public virtues, right? So you go home, you hang out with your family, and you, you have virtues. You work hard, you work hard at your job to make money, you take time to spend with your kids, you clean up your house, you build, you know, do home improvements, all these things take temperance and virtue. So it only takes away public virtue, right? You're not engaged as a citizen. But in the long run, he says, it attacks and destroys all the others and is finally absorbed into egoism. Just briefly, why is it that we suffer in the democratic times from individualism? He says, in aristocracies, there were these natural links between people, between lord and peasant, uh, between the different links of society. Um, in democracy, where there's constant movement in the social classes, right, where you move up and down, there aren't these lasting bonds. And so we tend to retreat to our own and just love our own. Unfortunately, right, um, often what we're doing on our own is that we're seeking wealth. We retreat to our families, to ourselves, and maybe we're not engaged in, in criminal activity, maybe we're not overly greedy, but we care primarily about improving ourselves and our lot. And I just wanted to point to this beautiful passage uh, about mat our materialism. Uh, he's comparing here, as I mentioned, aristocratic materialism and democratic materialism. And I think this is just such a really um, insightful passage because we, we think of ourselves, we all think of ourselves as middle class in America. We're, we're not decadent, we're not, um, you know, we're not buying Ferraris and vast palaces. We're just, okay, so let's just take a look here. He says, when the members of an aristocratic body turn exclusively in this way toward material enjoyments, when, when their materialism, they usually gather at this point alone all the energy that the long habit of power gave them. So they, they used to have actual political power. Now, as they're crumbling and they're losing their power, what are they gonna do with it? Right. To such men, that is crumbling aristocracy, the pursuit of well-being is not enough. They require a sumptuous depravity and a dazzling corruption. They worship the material magnificently and seem to vie with each other in their desire to excel in the art of making themselves into brutes. Right. If any of you have read The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde, I don't know if Oscar Wilde's on the, um, on the author bank, but here's a perfect example, right? This is Oscar Wilde, uh, sorry, Dorian Gray, uh, you know, the picture uh, that's hidden, which gets older as he continues to engage in all of these really um, decadent aristocratic practices, right? Food, drink, sex, violence. Um, and he doesn't get any older, but the picture, right, shows what is actually happening to his soul. That's somebody who has a lot of money, but no, no responsibility. But that's not us, right? Of course, we should feel good about this. We're, we're good middle-class bourgeois working Americans. Well, we have a materialism of our own, Tocqueville says. Right? Um, and this is the last paragraph. The taste for material enjoyments does not lead democratic peoples to such excesses. There, the love of well-being shows itself to be a tenacious, exclusive, universal passion, but contained. Right? But notice, tenacious, exclusive, universal, but contained. It's not for as much, but it's on our mind all the time. It's not a question of building vast palaces, of vanquishing or deceiving nature, of exhausting the universe in order to satisfy the better passions of a man. It is a matter of adding a few feet to his fields, planting an orchard, enlarging a house, of making life, and here's the key, easier and more comfortable each moment, of avoiding discomfort and satisfying the slightest needs effortlessly. Amazon Prime shipping, right? And almost without cost. These goals are small, but the soul becomes attached to them. It thinks about them every day and very closely. These goals finish by hiding from the soul the rest of the world and they sometimes come to stand between the soul and God. 
Um, in our Catholic tradition, I can talk to students about this and I say, look, uh, what he's talking about here is that, you know, we democratic people, the way we're attached to these things, um, it might not be what we consider a serious mortal sin and, and maybe not even a sin. We just, you know, if you go on Amazon and you look at books you wanna buy or fly fishing equipment, that's my, my passion uh, outside of school and family. I love to fly fish. Um, these things might not be sinful as a one-off, right? But look at what he says here, right? They are small, but the soul becomes attached to them. It thinks about them every day and very closely. These goals finish by hiding from the soul the rest of the world and sometimes come between the soul and God. So I, they are a threat to our salvation right? when we're constantly thinking about these things, right? If you're constantly thinking, Oh, I'm going to build a little bit more on my house. I'm going to get a really nice lawn. But it's not sinful to want a nice lawn, maybe. But if you think about it all the time and you don't pray, maybe it is. So this is interesting, right? I think he's pointing to this kind of democratic, bourgeois, middle-class materialism. Uh, not Dorian Gray, but something, something to look out for. All right. Um, the loss of greatness favoring the low over the high, right? Here's, uh, there are a number of examples here, uh, but Democrats, when it comes to the sciences, when it comes to art, when it comes to religion, they're always thinking about the useful and the practical, and that's good, that's fine. Um, we have to think about those things sometimes, but the elevated, the beautiful, the contemplative, because we're so busy, we're equal, we're constantly trying to not lose our money and to make more. We're constantly working. He says, even the rich in America work, right? We don't have time often for the high. Let me just give you a couple of examples here. A general remark at the beginning of the book, he says, I do not think there's any country in the world where in proportion to the population there exists so small a number of ignorant and fewer learned men than in America. He starts off by saying, everybody can read in America. In 1830, this is unique, but there aren't really well-educated Americans, right, who have had this much higher education is it's middling. We're mediocre. Everybody can read, but they're not reading Plato. <laughs> they're reading newspapers, he says, actually. Let's take a look at some examples. Um, one is in science. How do Americans practice science? And here he includes all areas of inquiry. He says, I think the mind, uh, we can divide science into three parts. The first contains theoretical notions. The second, uh, he says here, um, are close to theory, but quickly can move to application. And the third is pure application. Might be something like uh, metaphysics uh, or right, theoretical mathematics, engineering, and technicians, right? Three levels of this science, okay? Um, but look at this. What does he say about democratic peoples? Which one do we do of those three? I love this last paragraph, and this is important, I think, for especially those of us who come from religious traditions where contemplation is important. Belmont Abbey, we have monks here, contemplative monks. Nothing is more necessary to the cultivation of the advanced sciences or to the higher portion of the sciences than meditation. And nothing is less appropriate to meditation than the interior of a democratic society. There you do not find, as among aristocratic peoples, a numerous class that remains at rest, right? Uh, right. Um, amid this universal tumult, this repeated clash of contrary interests, this continual march of men towards fortune, where to find the calm necessary for profound intellectual syntheses, how to fix your thoughts on some point when everything around you moves, right? So if, if we think that... Um, Contemplation, meditation is something that is good and important for our souls, uh, for the sciences and, and pursuing them well. He says, there's something about democratic life that's really in tension with that. We're constantly moving, constantly uh, trying to move up, right? not move down. Here's, a, here's one that's really important, really interesting. He says, we have a tendency towards pantheism. For those of you who are not familiar with pantheism, it's an idea that God and nature are the same thing. Um, God and nature are the same. The universe existed forever, and that's what we call God. And this is interesting because I think he would say even Americans who call themselves Christians have a tendency towards pantheism. 
And this is related to the low. And I just want to read this passage. I think it's so important. It says, in democracies, the mind is obsessed by the idea of unity, looking for it in all directions. And when it believes unity has been found, it embraces it and rests there. Not only does the human mind to discover in the world only one creation and one creator, there aren't these levels like you have in aristocracy, one creation, one creator, that division of things still bothers it. And it readily tries to engage, enlarge and simplify its thought by containing God and the universe in a single whole, pull everything together. If I find a philosophic system according to which the things material and immaterial, visible and invisible that the world contains are no longer considered except as various parts of an immense being that alone remains eternal, right, I will have no difficulty that concluding that such a system, although it destroys human individuality, will have secret charms for men who live in democracy. All their intellectual habits prepare them for conceiving it and set them on the path to adopt it. I love this line. It naturally attracts their imagination, fixes it. It feeds the pride of their mind. Hey, look, I'm part of nature. God is nature. We're all part of God. And it flatters its laziness. Right? There's a certain laziness in pantheism, he would argue. We're all just part of this big thing. We don't need to make distinctions. We're all part of the universe. Right? But here's the important point he makes at the end. He does not like this. He thinks this is really dangerous. Among the different systems, by the aid of which philosophy seeks to explain the world, pantheism seems to me the one most likely to seduce the human mind in democratic centuries. All those who remain enamored of the true grandeur of man must join forces and struggle against it. An interesting statement. Right? If you think man is elevated, is, is grand, that there's a dignity to human beings, we should resist pantheism. Because, hey, look, in pantheism, we might say, we're part of the universe and we're all together and we're part of God. On the other hand, we're the same as rocks and trees and dogs, right? There's nothing particularly elevated about human beings, but this is something that is inherent in our mores, right? Even those who call ourselves Christians, sometimes you listen to certain Christian hymns, modern Christian hymns, you go, huh, there's a lot of stuff about like nature loving in here. Not about angels or, or saints or God. Um, what's going on? Okay. A couple of others, I don't think we have time to get to. So we're just going to skip over those. You can go back and look at them. Our, our moral system, how we view the arts, also very practical, very useful. Um, I do like just one quick line there. Um, he says, I doubt that men in virtuous were more virtuous in aristocratic centuries than in others. He's always... Um, pretty moderate in that sense. He doesn't think one time in history was so much better than the other, but it is certain that they talked about the beauties of virtue and not about how it was useful. Americans talk about how virtue is useful. It's not beautiful and poetic. It's in your interest to help other people. Uh, it's a fam famous Yogi Berra line for those of you with the parents who are on here. Yogi Berra, catcher for the Yan Yankees in the fifties had funny lines, but uh, he'd say, uh, oh gosh, now I lost my train of thought here. Um, oh yeah, always go to other people's funerals, otherwise they won't go to yours. Kind of a funny line, right? Because he doesn't mean that the, the corpse won't go to your funeral, right? But, but that's the idea of democratic morality he says, right? Do good for other people because then they'll return the favor. <laughs> Not a very high and elevated view of morality. All right, the good. We're gonna talk about these, we're gonna have to kind of speed through these a little bit, right? What are some of the good things he sees in American democracy? That's what you're always looking for in these passages. How is he critical? How does he elevate democracy? We're gonna talk about Christianity associations and then one last passage, All right? Look at what he says about the loss of religion. Tocqueville treats religion and Christianity extensively in this book. There are probably a hundred pages on religion and its relationship to freedom, its relationship to uh, having an elevated democracy. Look at what he says happens to a people when they lose religion when they lose Christianity. When religion is destroyed among a people, doubt takes hold of the highest portions of the intellect. We start doubting everything and half paralyzes the others. We become anxious, we can't, we can't do anything. 
intellectually. Each person gets accustomed to having only confused and changing notions about the matters that most interest his fellows and himself. Is there a God? Is God good? Is there an afterlife? We don't know. You defend your opinions badly or you abandon them. And since you despair of being able by yourself to solve the greatest problems that human destiny presents, you are reduced like a coward to not thinking about them. Now, we always see reason and, 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 and faith pitted against each other in the modern world. What he's saying is when you don't have religion, very often you don't reason at all because you become so paralyzed without some anchor to grasp onto. Such a state, he says, cannot fail to enervate souls. It slackens and motivates the forces of will, it makes us weak and prepares citizens for servitude. This is great. These last two paragraphs, so insightful. Then not only does it happen that the latter allow their liberty to be taken, but they often give it up. They give their liberty away. When authority no longer exists in religious matters, any more than in political matters, men are soon frightened by the sight of this limitless independence. This perpetual agitation of all things disturbs and exhausts them. Since everything shifts in the intellectual world, they at least want everything to be firm and stable in the material order and no longer able to recapture their ancient beliefs. They give themselves a master. Right. At one point he says, religion is a salutary yoke, right? And Christ talks about his own yoke, we know, right? It's a salutary yoke, it's, it's a light yoke. Yes, it constrains what we can think and do, but it's something that ultimately makes us free, right? Christ tells us, right? You shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free, right? But he says, when you don't have that light yoke, what happens? You're going to give yourself a, a master. Um, for the parents on, right, we know the Bob Dylan line, you got to serve someone. And Tocqueville says, if it's not going to be, if it's not going to be God, and it's not going to be through religion, it's going to be through a despot, through a tyrant, right? He, he has another line. I didn't have it here, right? He says, I do not think that one can be completely independent of religion and remain free. To be free, one must believe. Now, that sounds like bad news, I'm sorry. So where's the good news? The good news is that when he came to America and he compares it with post-revolutionary France, in France, he saw liberty and religion at odds with one another. You could either be for liberty or you could be for faith because of the historical uh, circumstances in France where the clergy were part of what many saw as, uh, they, they, they looked at them as the oppressors, right? So they saw liberty and, and religion uh, as at odds. He doesn't think that's actually the case in his book on uh, the French Revolution, but we can't get there. But not in the United States. What does he say? When I arrived in the United States, it was the religious aspect of the country that first struck my eyes. As I prolonged my journey, I noticed the great political consequences that flowed from these new facts. I had seen among us the spirit of religion and the spirit of liberty march almost always in opposite directions among us, the French. Here I found them intimately joined the one to the other. They reigned together over the same soil. He has a lengthy section where he points to what he thinks is the founding of America what he calls the point of departure. And interestingly, he does not point to 1776 or 1789, the Declaration or the Constitution, but he points to the Puritans and their arrival at the Plymouth Colony. Right? The Puritans, he wants to point to the Puritans as our founders because in them, he sees a spirit of liberty, of self-government that goes along with religious faith. Right? Now, of course, the question would be, uh, if that is waning in the United States right now, right? Um, if that is, uh, is waning in the United States, do we still receive what he says, those political consequences? Um, so I just saw a quick question about favorite translation. Uh, there is an online Liberty version that Liberty Fund puts up, uh, but I would recommend the Harvey Mansfield translation. That's what I use uh, for my class. All right, let's take a look at some more here. The other really good thing he points to, and this combats individualism that we talked about um, in, in the bad. He talks about these things called voluntary associations. Americans 
associate. Let's take a look at what he says here. This is something he loves about America. He thinks they're doing this really well. Americans of all ages, of all conditions, of all minds constantly unite. Not only do they have commercial and industrial associations, corporations in which they all take part, trade associations, unions, but also they have a thousand other kinds, religious, moral, intellectual, serious ones, useless ones, very general and very particular ones, right? Uh, Stamp Collectors Association, Boy Scouts of America, PTA, Knights of Columbus, immense and very small ones. Americans associate to celebrate holidays, establish seminaries, build inns, erect churches, distribute books, send missionaries to the antipodes. In this way, they create hospitals, prisons, schools. If finally it is a matter of bringing a truth to light or developing a sentiment with the support of a good example, they associate. Wherever, at the head of a new undertaking, you see in France the government, in England a great lord, count on seeing in the United States an association. In democratic countries, the science of association is the mother science. The progress of all others depends on the progress of the former. I love that line, it's the mother science. It's so important for him. Right? Uh, Aristotle, for example, talks about the architectonic science, the highest science is politics. But for Tocqueville, it seems like this association, getting together in these voluntary associations, this helps to pre preserve our liberty, to bring us out of ourselves and those individualistic things, those tendencies we have to just retreat into our family life and care about ourselves and, and our own small families. Right? It's associations. Right? Of course, if this is on the wane, right? If, if this is on the decline in America, we have something to worry about. There's a book in the 1990s called Bowling Alone, very famous social science book. Most social science isn't worth reading. This one's not bad, right? In the 1990s, he looks at the decline of associations in American life. Bowling Alone, people used to bowl in leagues, he tells us. Uh, Putnam is the name of the author. Now they don't, we go by ourselves. Uh, what have we lost because of that? But he does see it as something good and we can still do it. Okay. Last one, uh, and then we'll kind of turn it over to questions. And this turns to the end of the book. And this responds to that first part, uh, that bad thing, how we've moved away from greatness, from the glorious things, high elevated contemplation, science, arts for the useful. Tocqueville has a response to this, and this is the very end of the book. Last chapter, I, I had read a passage from this at the beginning. And I call it justice over greatness. He makes the following sort of beautiful observation here at the end, which we can agree or disagree with. But when the world was filled with very great and very small, very rich and very poor, this is aristocracy, right? Very learned and very ignorant, very fortunate and very miserable men. I turned my eyes away from the second to fix them only on the first. And the latter delighted my sight. He loved to, to look at the beautiful, the great men, the intelligent men, the great minds. He loved to look at them. But I understand that this pleasure arose from my weakness. It is because I cannot see all that surrounds me at the same time that I am allowed to choose in this way and to separate among so many objects, those that it pleases me to consider. It is not the same for the all powerful and eternal being whose eyes necessarily take in the whole of things and who sees all of humanity and each man distinctly, though at the same time, right? He's counted the hairs on our head, scripture tells us, right? It is natural to believe that what most satisfies the sight of this creator of God and preserver of men is not the singular prosperity of the few, but the greatest well-being of all. So what seems to me decline, me Tocqueville, decline, the greatness of aristocracy to the mediocrity of democracy, is in his eyes progress. What hurts me agrees with him. Equality is perhaps less elevated, but it is more just, and its justice makes its grandeur and its beauty. I try hard to enter into this point of view of God, and from there I seek to consider and to judge human things. So he sees that I, with all of these, these threats uh, and these drawbacks of equality and, 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 and democracy, and, and they're real for him. He doesn't, he doesn't just brush them aside. He's truly worried about what democracy can become, uh, that it can make us depraved and, and beast-like and, and brutes. 
That's, that's a possibility. Um, but he also sees that th the goods of equality are real. The fact that you can develop your talents in equality, that you don't have to be what your father was, right? The fact that you get to choose who you marry in a democracy where you might not in an aristocracy, that's a good thing, right? There are so many blessings that come from equality. Yeah, perhaps we all think about work all the time. Maybe we're a lot more practical than some of the great authors in aristocratic times, the great artists, but there is something that seems to be good and just about democracy and it is still redeemable in his eyes. Um, so with that, I know I've talked about a whole lot. Uh, there's so much more that one can talk about. Um, I did not do justice to Tocqueville, but I wanted you to see a little bit of how he sees uh, some problems in democracy, but also some of the good he sees, at least in the way that America has done democracy through associations, through Christianity um, and, and the goodness of equality. And with that, I'm gonna stop sharing here. Um, and um, yeah, <laughs> not enough time, but I took too much time, so I'm sorry. <laughs> That was amazing. Oh my goodness. Um, I, I took a lot of notes and I didn't even have a notebook, so uh, I have to decipher it. But yeah, thank you so much. This was this was incredible. I got we got a lot of comments on just the, the quality of the presentation. And no wonder that that the Abbey has has grown so much the last few years. I mean, if that's that's what the students are receiving, that kind of education. Um, you know, I, I started before I went to Hillstead, I started a big public research university where I was a number. I didn't even I wasn't even able to talk to a professor, you know, until like two and a half years in. And 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 at the Abbey, right? They can take your classes the very first year, right. uh, and that's just a, makes such a difference. Um, I do. I have a few questions myself, but also if if sure. uh, any of the, the attendees have questions, please. There's yeah, a please. few questions in the chat. Um, we already. I put the a link of of your favorite translation of Democracy in America in in the chat. Um, I guess my question is when, when were when did you first read to Tocqueville? Um, I, I assume you've read, read him many many times, but kind of when was the first time you were exposed to him, um, and and how did it kind of impact you personally and, and you know obviously later professionally as well? Sure. Uh, at the Abbey uh, was the first time I read it as a student as a student, and um, my my mentor Dr. Gene Thewitt, who is the intellectual arch architect of the Honors College in many ways, he was the um, the honors program director. Uh, before we were able to fully revamp this into the rigorous great books program, he was trying to bring some great books to the old honors program. And we had a course called the American Founding that was half, half Federalist Papers and Constitution and half Tocqueville. Now we've been able to split that up into two classes in the new honors college, which is great. So we get to do an entire constitution course and the entire Tocqueville course. Um, but you know, I, I didn't quite get it then. Um, and it wasn't in grad school upon rereading that I went, oh my gosh, not only are these things uh, so insightful, um, but they, they're so beautifully written. I mean, there are, there are passages now, and it's cheesy as it sounds because it's not Dante and it's not poetry, but there are things, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm literally moved to tears when I read some of these things because it is so clear that this is not an academic exercise for Tocqueville. This is, this is about living a good life. And he is deeply, deeply concerned about that. Um, so, yeah. And then um, a student going to, to the Abbey, when are they gonna be first exposed? Could it be their freshman year or is there a specific yeah. student for their event? Yeah, um, we do start the American founding class sophomore year with a small Tocqueville passage, but uh, it's currently in our fourth year, which uh, we call the crises of the West which is a part of our curriculum that is kind of different from a lot of other great books programs. Um, we do ancients, Christians, moderns, that's of great books, first three years. And we do this thing called the crises of the West, which brings those questions to bear on the 20th and 21st century, where we're reading contemporary philosophers, poets, theologians who are steeped in the tradition, right? Mm -hmm. So T.S. Eliot, Pope Benedict XVI, Joseph Pieper, uh, Jacques Maritain, and so this is like, hey, okay, now you're about to go out into America and all you have right now is CNN and Fox News um, and whatever we may like those, you know, to varying degrees, depending on our political leanings, but, but there's a whole lot more to understanding the broader tradition of America than those voices. And if you want a way out, um, the echo chambers of, of the 24 hour news cycle is probably not the best way. Um, so we're saying before you get out there, 
hey, let's compare it to aristocracy. Let's, let's do it in a way that um, gives us distance from the current political anger, right? So you can reflect on it uh, in a way um, that is sort of peace, not, not peaceful, safe. It's a safe space in the best sense of the word, right? Where you get to say, like, we can talk about these complex questions without being accused of, oh, you're just a partisan hack, right? You go, okay, um, yeah, well, what is, it, what is it like when we, we, when we move from, from the beautiful to the practical? Something good, something not so good, right? Um, and that's not a Democrat or Republican thing. That is a, a human thing. So do you, do you think, before we get to Chris's question, uh, just to piggyback back on that, um, that his being an outsider, right, coming from a foreign country, and that perspective being non, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking a lot about yeah. myself, find myself in a room where I'm kind of like in the middle as a German, where I'm like, I'm not quite here, but I'm also not there. Let's find common ground. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm thinking of some other authors that uh, I was exposed to actually first time in the U.S., uh, St. John Grefcore, right, who wrote as, as Grefcore. Yeah, we, we teach him in, uh, in, the, in the founding class. Right, yeah, yeah. and oh, perfect, yeah, and, and writing about, you know, I think it's letters from an American farmer, and then letter three is what is an American, and I was so inspired by that, right, is that uh, I think sometimes when we are, and, and maybe you can, you can speak to that, right, Americans growing up in America, can they have that unbiased kind of look at, at their own country, and it's, I find myself often defending America, you know, to, to, right. to America because they only see the one side so kind of his, his outside perspective uh how much did that add um was he received better because he came as an outsider or mm -hmm. yeah i mean uh i think that 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 certainly adds to the um to the trustworthiness of him as you know uh, his ethos if we talk about aristotle's rhetoric right you, you want to show that you're impartial um and i think that it does i mean it's it's uncertain how much Americans at the time were seeing the work, right? So uh, it being in French and, and not working its way back into America. Um, he does have interesting lines in there. At one point he says, uh, when he's really critical about the fact that there's not a lot of freedom of ideas in America or freedom of thought, he says, um, he says, when I say this, every American will be, will at first jump to condemn what I've just said. And then later on, they'll go back and forgive me uh, in the silence of their own heart because they know that I'm right. <laughs> so, um, you know, at one point he does say Americans are, are pretty, um, uh, you know, think of the American, yeah, America, woo! The t-shirts with the flags and the eagles and all that. It, it does say, you know, Americans are very defensive um, uh, of their country. Um, so, um, nice. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know enough about the historical receiving of it at different points uh, after that, so. Right. Uh, yeah, I think what you what you said the, the the formidable circle around thought. I mean that that really that really stuck with me, and it's so applicable to today and the and the echo chambers that we often find ourselves in. Um, Chris Wright, um, yeah. from Thomas Jefferson Classical Academy. Yeah, John Chris, um, good friend of ours. Uh, yep. Asking, about, you know, I mean it is a challenging read. It's a long read. Sure. Um, if you want to tackle it in in a high school curriculum. Where would you put it? Would you assign? Well, probably not the whole thing, right? Is there right. are there parts that, that you would recommend? Sure. Yeah, you know, I'm actually I'm trying to get some funding to put on a, a summer workshop for high school teachers about how to implement Tocqueville into their curriculum. So I've been thinking about it. I, I think if you can find some willing professor or willing teachers at at high schools to do it, Volume Two has these very easy self-contained snippets that cover so many different areas, like how we do technology, how we do rhetoric, how we do religion, how we do philosophy, uh, how we do money and commerce. A way you could do it, if you have, if you're setting up a school where, um, uh, if you're setting up a school where, um, you know, there's a sort of unity between what you're seeing in different classes and there's an openness to the big questions, I would say, I think you can integrate it into all those different classes. Right? You can have these short passages that uh, a literature professor can put in there and say, here's what this guy thought about American literature. Is that still true? America has not produced any great authors, he says at eight, in 1831. I and mean, this is before Melville and others. But, you know, what does he mean by that? Here's what American poetry is like. Is that actually true? Here's what Americans think about money. Is that true? Um, and so I think the, the best way to do it would be to, to look at those passages, maybe suggest to different teachers how they could 
look at this really interesting thing that touches on what you love in your discipline and Tocqueville thought about it. Um, certainly government classes, I think you could do more. You can, especially more of volume one. It's worth pairing that along with the constitution because he does have a lengthy section where he goes through the various parts of the constitution. So seeing here's what the federalists, Hamilton and, and Madison thought and the anti-federalists, here's what this outsider Frenchman thought uh, about this. So um, I think, yeah. Yeah, um, absolutely. The, um, the, the kind of tissue between different classes and, and different um, ideas. And yeah, um, yeah. we got a question here, uh, Joe, about um, you know some of the uh, you know uh, nuances to some of the words that Tocqueville uses: equality, democracy, aristocracy. Yeah. The translation, um, you know. Uh, do you get a sense, I assume you haven't read it in the original French, but from your studies, um, the way we read those words, the way he intended them, are there nuances to that that maybe are not conveyed as well in the English language that you, that you know of? Um, I, don't, I don't know if it's a matter of translation. I think he is always kind of giving you the definition of those things, right? So for democracy, uh, you know, for so many of us in our own context, we are automatically jumped to a type of regime and government. And he is kind of telling you what he means by democracy. There can be a democratic social state, a democratic government. It is um, overall just a, a system that loves equality uh, and wants to push equality to its natural limits, or sometimes it's unnatural limits. Mm -hmm. And so he's always kind of giving you uh, those things. When he talks about American equality, he says, you know, um, we love equality, but we don't like forced equality of income, for example. And so Americans like the idea, even though we like equality and we, we hate aristocracy, we hate privilege, right? Uh, so when you hear about special interests in legislative bills, we get mad about it, right? Well, the, the rich shouldn't get special privileges. On the other hand, the idea of a leveling of redistribution in America, he says there's nothing they hate more than the permanent equality of, of outcome. Is that still the case today? I don't know. Um, but so he is kind of, he'll give you like, here's, here's the type of equality when we talk about it. Here's what Americans think about it, what they like about it when they say they're in favor of equality. Here's not what they mean. Um, mm -hmm. And for aristocracy, I think he's always showing you what is what aristocracy is not to show you what it is very often, right? He'll, he'll show you Lawyers in America are sort of like an aristocracy because they love forms and regularity and the intellect, but they're not quite arist aristocrats, right? Because they don't have landed, they're not landed gentry with a permanent position. Um, the rich who do well commercially are sort of like an aristocracy. Jeff Bezos is sort of an aristocrat, but, but he's not. Uh, Native Americans, he points to, in some ways have aristocratic tendencies, the, the uh, certain understandings of virtue but they're not, right? Uh, Southern slave owners uh, in a bad example, he says, are sort of like an aristocracy, but not. So, I, I mean, I think he's always, um, I don't know if there's nuances in the translation so much as um, you're trying to figure out exactly what he means by how he describes it and contextualizes those words. So. Yeah, and I mean, that's true still today, right? When we, when, when, when we say words like equality, not everyone is, 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 is having the exact same notion. Right. Is it equality of opportunity? Are we talking equality of outcome? Right. What is there too much equality? Um, uh, comment on equality, actually, by Tom Carroll. Uh, yeah. Interesting. Tocqueville places on equality as a defining principle of the experiment. Mm -hmm. Essentially, a radical idea in the context of historical aristocracy and royal succession that dominated the world previously, and of course, ultimately has its roots in the teachings of Jesus Christ. We are all creating the image and likeness of God. And it's an ideal, not perfectly represented in our early days, that nonetheless keeps pushing us to a fuller realization of right. quality. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a couple of things there. And I, I just got to see Tom the other day. He was visiting the Abbey. So uh, I guess you and I both saw him pretty recently. So uh, thanks so much, Tom. Um, yeah. I mean, a couple of things in reference to what you say there, right? Um, it's a defining principle of the American experiment. There's this wonderful passage we didn't get to tonight where he says, He's talking about liberty and equality. Which one do we like more? Uh, and and it's I, I always compare this with a Burke reading uh, in my in my founding class, where Burke says Americans love liberty and they would rather die than be without it. Uh, and that's when he's addressing Parliament during the Revolution. I compare that with Tocqueville, where he says, "Look, Americans they like liberty, they they shoot for it, 
but man, they love nothing more than equality. And they would rather be, this is this line that he has in there. And I think there's a certain truth to it and we ought to be really careful about it. He says, they would prefer equality in slavery rather than liberty with an aristocracy, right? They would rather be equally slaves than to tolerate aristocracy. Um, and he's constantly pointing that. He says, you can have an equal social state. You can have an equal social state without liberty, right? And he points to the fact that he says the goods of equality can so easily be seen, right? My neighbor has a new minivan. I want a new minivan, right? We're equal, right? Liberty, and by, by liberty, he means political participation primarily. That's how he uses liberty. It's not so much, it's not that, that uh, sort of libertarian sense of I can do whatever I want as long as I'm not hurting anyone else. It really is for him, the ability to participate in self-government the goods of that are, are often um, not so readily apparent to us, right? You get into an argument over Thanksgiving dinner, over politics, people aren't talking to each other, you have mean posts on social media, I don't do it, but, um, you know, so the ability to vote and to be active politically, we often see like, oh, there's so much, so much uh, meanness and, and, and bad that comes with that. It's hard to see the goods of it, and it slowly just escapes from us because we don't see that. Um, and the bads of too much equality, we, we can't see the bads, right? Um, so that's, that's important. And the other thing you said, I mean, I think that's exactly right, Tom. I mean, when he begins the introduction at the beginning uh, of volume one, he goes through this long historical progress. Uh, we only, I only read a short passage of it. It goes on for about three pages of the various stages of moving towards equality. And, and the first stage is what? He says, it's opening, it's the church opening the ranks of the clergy to everyone. Um, I mean, it goes, I mean, you're pointing to something more fundamental, which is, right, equality in the image and likeness of God, but you see that sort of made manifest in the church opening up the clergy, right, not just to the nobles. Certainly there are, no, you know, noble, uh, Thomas Aquinas is, uh, you know, from a noble family, many others, but but to all. Uh, and that's one of the first steps. And then it's after them, it's the uh, the merchants, or the, it's them, then the lawyers, the merchants, then, right, all these different classes who Right, um, but I, I think that's right. Um, yeah, that's great. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, well, this was this has been so delightful. Um, I, you know, we're, this is going to be recorded. Um, you know, you can you can um, find on YouTube the previous two as well, the one on Dante um, and the one on Tolkien. Um, if you want to uh, watch those. Um, and then, of course, this will be made available as a recording. And if you have not checked out Belmont Abbey College yet, you definitely should. I think today was a was a, was a great example of why 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 you should uh, look into that school. Um, and, and Joseph, if you want to, before um, uh, people log off, uh, how how can they best reach you uh, if they want to get in touch with you or or the Abbey? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm going to put my email address up here. Perfect. And uh, but I'm also going to put. Uh, I'm, I'm using, I, I'm not a tech guy, but I've always had such a tough time scheduling. I go back and forth on interviews to schedule uh, or emails to schedule interviews and things, but I'm, I'm always happy to talk. Uh, the best part of my administrative life is talking with students and parents. Um, and so I'm gonna put this, I have Calendly now, which is a uh, automatic scheduling app. Um, and I'm just gonna put that on there. You can put that up. Um, you can click on that link. Calendly.com, Joseph Lysaki. Oh, and you can just schedule a time to talk with you. And I'm, uh, you know, uh, I, I have lots of meetings and things, but that app is great because it just schedules, it shows you my availability around that. And I'm, I am truly always delighted to talk with uh, parents and students time. who are interested. Resisted for a long time, but you get that, that, that rush of when you get an email, you've been booked. Too many. Like, Someone wants to talk to me. It's amazing. <laughs> I know. Yeah. It's so much easier than going back and forth on the email to schedule things. So Wonderful. Yeah. Well, uh, I think. Uh, I saw one more question. Uh, I don't know if. It, uh, yeah. Sorry. Oh, wow. it, yes. yeah. wow. In a democracy, could the ego of the elected, combined with inequality of wealth distribution, eventually lead to its downfall? Um, yeah. Yeah. There's. There's no yes. doubt. Um, <laughs> I, I don't. I'd have to think more about that. Um, but I think there are things in the in the Federalist Papers that would indicate uh, the problem there, and certainly the anti-Federalists. Mm -hmm. um, as much as as much as we want freedom and the ability to pursue wealth according to our talents, the anti-federalists were very worried about not having a strong middle class. And if you and it, a republic is very hard to maintain, 
uh, with a very large distribution of wealth. Even if everybody's doing okay and has cell phones and iPhones and all that, um, there can be too much resentment and envy. That is a democratic vice. Envy is a particularly democratic vice. Um, and so I think uh, that's right, Rob. Um, certainly more could be said, but yeah, thank you. Schedule a meeting. <laughs> Talk it out. Right. Wonderful. Well, thanks everyone for attending. This was this was so much fun. Um, and I hope you join us again uh, next week. Um, and again, Dr. Wysocki, very grateful. Um, Thank you for the opportunity. Absolutely. Have a great night. Yep. Bye. God bless. Bye.